umc.org. That's an eight-hour course. It's UMCOR, uh, United Methodist Committee on Relief, and VIM certified trainers lead that course. It credentials you to go beyond the bounds of the annual conference. This is a short course specific to our event that we have in Louisiana right now to help give you some background, orientation, some do's and don'ts, some do no harm, and some best practices. Fair? Yep. We're ready to roll. I've condensed an 87-page manual to one page front and back. If you want to distribute those, there are a couple of stacks of them. This will be available, I think, online. Thank you to Trinity for, and Rustin for uh, providing the service of streaming, but also for uh, recording. I understand it's going to be on your website, uh, and they have video there, uh, some sort of streaming. You can look at it. I don't fool with that. My gift is not technology. My gift is not uh, administration. My gift is whacking trees with chainsaws. That's what I was born to do in Tarpon Houses. Uh, the, the event that uh, we're dealing with, the flooding in South Louisiana, uh, covers a huge area. I would estimate 100 miles wide from I-55 in Hammond all the way to Lafayette and approximately a bell-shaped curve because the east and western boundaries are not as concentrated as the central around Baton Rouge and Lafayette, or, I'm sorry, Baton Rouge and Denham Springs or further inland to the upper reaches above, Lafay uh, above Baton Rouge, Zachary in that area up in Greensburg. That gives us a 500 square mile zone. That's huge. We're using a collaborative online database called crisiscleanup.org. As of Friday morning, we had 37 VOAD approved agencies that registered. Only those registered agencies can input and extract client data from that. The last I looked, there were about 4,000 households that had registered. It's estimated in that area that there are 40,000 households that have been affected uh, at a level where they'll need uh, some assistance. Many of those people will get assistance from neighbors, from family, from friends, from other organizations. They'll have their work done by contractors. It's my job to try to put you in a place of logistical support where you'll have a place to stay the night, where you'll have something over your head, and where you'll have jobs, you'll have clients that you can serve. If you're not able to go on a specific trip, this week or next week or something, there are support activities that you can do in your hometown, right here in Ruston or anywhere around the state. We will follow up every client that we claim on this database, is what we call claiming, with a phone call to assure them that someone is tracking them or, or following them up, and we want to see if the work has been done. We don't want to send you or any other crew that comes from across the state or across the country, and right now there are 17 teams that have registered from outside the bounds of the conference. That was as of yesterday morning. I haven't updated the, the spreadsheet, but there's probably another dozen by now. So people are coming from all over the country uh, to South Louisiana, and uh, we're not alone. The people down there, part of what we do says we're not alone. The motto of early response teams, and as I said earlier, this is not a certified, UMCOR certified ERT training. That's an eight hour course. You'll see that listed on the bottom of the page when that's offered in that range. And you can check the conference website to location and times. But the motto of early response team members and teams is providing a caring Christian presence in the aftermath of disaster providing a caring Christian presence in the aftermath of disaster. In fact, it's listed there at the bottom of your page and several other places. I'd like for us to say that together. Providing a caring Christian presence in the aftermath of disaster. So you see some of the objectives that we have. Disaster response teams support recovery for survivors and we provide certain things. This disaster belongs to the people that have gone through it. It's not our disaster. We come alongside them to assist and, and help them in whatever way we can. We go as servants of theirs. This is not, doesn't belong to us. It's not our job to go in there and fix things. It's our job to come alongside and help. Some of the things that we do, the most important thing is to listen. Those who have gone through this are wounded right now. And one of the assigned tasks, we have assigned specific 
past when we were on an ERT team. And as I said, this is a condensed version. But one of our assigned tasks is a listener. We have a person on the team who is assigned to be the listener. And when we went to Red Bird Mission with the Grace Methodist Church of Ruston a month or so ago, each day we had a person or persons who were going to specifically sit down with Miss Irma and just listen to her. Now, I also encourage the team, and we encourage every ERT team, if we have a bunch of work to do and we're rolling with a bunch of guys that aren't really good listeners, we say we'll commit to each one speaking to the client if they're on site, and sometimes they won't be there. But we commit to each person speaking and slowing down and talking to that client every day we're on site. How are you doing? And let them know. Good to see you again. Been thinking of you. There's some do's and don'ts in that, and we'll get down to that. The ministry of presence, you see that on the sheet. She's assuring them that they're not alone. There's something that happens when you show up with that cross and twain on your shirt. When we roll up with those logos on the trailer, we went to Lafayette after a 15-inch rain, which is nothing compared to what's happened down there this time. And just to roll into a neighborhood with the logo on the side of the van and on the side of the truck, uh, on the side of the trailer, and people came out of there and they were waiting. Pastor showed up and said, You're here. The Methodists are here. We don't do anything else. And I've drug trailers all up and down this week because I didn't want to leave them in the flood zone with a lot of gear in them. But also, I like to be rolling down the highway with the Methodists. It's a rolling billboard, runs, makes about eight miles to the gallon. <laughs> and it says, You're not alone. We're here for you. That's just a silent witness. So the Ministry of Presence, a lot of what we do has to do with what we call damage mitigation. We try to make properties accessible to the families, the homeowners, the residents, as well as to those who follow after us. That means removing uh, hazards. If it's a storm that's dropped trees, we take trees out of roofs, we take them off of driveways, we take down trees, we cut them up, we haul them to the road. If it means tarping so that it, more rain can't get in the house, we do that. Uh, debris removal, mucking out houses, why would we do that? They've had four feet of water in the house, why would we do that? Because mold right now in South Louisiana, it's hot and it's humid. And what mold, what grows mold? Hot and humid. My daughter was evacuated by boat. She lived a mile away from Rainy Meat River. She took a video of the current and it was swirling around the utility poles there. And that current picked things up and drove them through windows and storefronts and knocked doors down and pushed walls open. And all that muck from the Amy River went into those houses. And then when it went out, whatever was upstream in those neighborhoods went back into those houses. And so everything they own is just soaked and sitting there until you come. So debris removal. Temporary repairs, temporary. And here it says we try to make it safe, sanitary, and secure. We only do what's allowable in that specific phase that we call early response. We are not early responders. We follow search and rescue. We don't go in until we're invited. We don't go uninvited. One of the big second disaster items that happens after a disaster is uninvited volunteers. We call them SUVs. Think about a suburban video and it stands for spontaneously uninvited volunteers. They show up, they don't have training, they don't have tools, they don't have, uh, we had a guy walk in, we were in Lancaster, Texas doing tornado cleanup. A guy walked in and said, hey, I'm here to work. Uh, he had no background check. Uh, he had flip flops on and he wants to work with the chainsaw crew. I can't. That's not, that's not gonna fly, and I don't know who this guy is. So we try to, so the second thing that comes, up, we call it the second wave of the disaster is supplies that aren't needed. And after Katrina, we were in Ponchatoula, and we had a mound of clothing in a gymnasium that eventually had to be picked up with a forklift, loaded onto a truck, and sent to a rag factory. They don't need that. Let's not send a tractor trailer full of teddy bears. There are some things that they need. 
talk to you about that later. You can find some of those things, I believe, on the conference website. We would only do the repairs that are necessary at the time to make the property safe and to limit further damage. We don't want to jeopardize their eligibility for insurance payments or for FEMA funding. And to that, you'll notice on your list is we suggest, and they may have done it, and we always do it with their permission to take a lot of digital photos. Because when that time comes, and most of these people don't have flood insurance, uh, they're not insured. They have homeowners, but if you don't have specific flood insurance, you, have, you get nothing. Now, they'll give up to 33,000, I think, on this event, but that's the maximum. Uh, I was in one house that was probably a $150,000 home, fairly moderate home down there, and at their best, they'll get at the maximum 33,000 to repair and rebuild. That's why the second wave of volunteers that you will be a part of to rebuild is so critical to hang sheetrock, to help lay flooring, to paint. That's a huge, huge gift that you can make to those people. Okay, why do we go? We go for others. What's our motto? Providing a caring Christian presence in the aftermath of disaster. It's not about you and me. It's about them. And it's not about the task. It's about the people. We try to be careful about what we say. In fact, it's probably good for us. We were given what? How many years? Yeah. And one and a half. Why? Listen to my strikes to tell. And as a pastor, I've been in hospital rooms where somebody came in. I'm sitting with somebody who's about to have surgery, and a visitor comes in and said, Oh man, I had my gizzard taken out <laughs> three years ago, and they start showing scars and telling how horrible everything was. And I'm about to get up and we do some ministry of laying on hands because you're hurting that person. You don't, they don't need that. So we listen, listen, love, love. We listen. And it's not about us. It's not about us. If we're going in there to feel good about, hey, I did this and I did that, and you're going to get more than you give by doing what we're doing. Uh, but we'd be careful to say, hey, I know how you feel, or I, you know, I went through this terrible time myself. I mean, I've been through that. I grew up in New Orleans. I grew up with hurricanes. We've had our house crushed and everything else. Typical disaster response team tasks. There are tasks. So we have a presence. That's our being, if you will. And then we have our doing. And our tasks are debris removal. These are several possible tasks. This is going to be huge. Dragging debris to roadsides to a designated place. It's important for us to get that debris where it can be picked up. Following the spring floods this year, uh, we took a crew over to Monroe and we spent three days just moving debris from one place closer to the road because the FEMA contractor contacted me and said, there's a whole neighborhood of people who got the debris out, but it's not in the right of way. We don't pick up unless we can reach it with the claw that's 15 feet from this edge of the road. Their debris pile is in the middle of their yard, probably 30 feet away. They've already mucked their house out, their furniture's out there, all their personal belongings, and it's a mound half the size of the house. So we went over there with the tractor with a front end loader. And if anyone has one for sale, talk to me. Um, and we picked that gear up, but it, it had to be a lot of it picked up by hand and loaded off and put on the street. That's a ministry, debris removal. Tarping, uh, number two, we're not going to be doing tarping on this one, but that's one of the things sometimes we'll do. Muckouts, uh, this is uh, what I call the most laborious and least glorious work in the universe. And that's what we're faced with, mucking out homes. I'll just be honest with you. Taking out wet material, it could be belongings, personal belongings, furniture, clothing, um, sheet rock, uh, insulation. And there are ways to do that, and we're going to get to some best practices. We may be assigned to assessment, and we said earlier, we have to stay flexible. Every day can change. Right now, now they're in a very fluid uh, state, and constant flux. Things tomorrow will be different from they are the way they are today. You may show up down there, and the client base may have strangely moved or somehow evaporated right in the city if you're stationed, say, in Dunham Springs and you have to travel out further, and it's gonna require some sacrifice for you to sit in your air-conditioned vehicle for an extra 30 minutes to get to somebody who hasn't had air conditioning for a week. I'm not 
feeling sorry for them. <laughs> That's why we go. And if it requires sacrifice on our part, we're going for them, not for us. So um, we stay flexible. Assessment work, that could be windshield and door to door where we, we find out there's a community out in the country that no one's come to. And that's where I love to be. And they don't have a client stream, if you will. They haven't been registered or put into crisis cleanup or followed up by anyone. And we may assign you to assessment. It's pretty rare. There are specialized groups that do assessment work and they do it better than we do it. And, and each of us doing our part, we work together. The fifth one is to, to handle supplies and or distribution. A load of flood buckets may show, hey Jerry, hey Leva, good to see y'all. Uh, if a load of flood buckets shows up, who's been unloading them up to this time? The members of the Denham Springs Church and some people who've walked up as volunteers. 90% of those members have lost their homes. They have two people, a husband and wife. The four days I was down there this past week, every time I walked through that church, and I was not in there a lot, but it was a hit and run. Every time I walked through there, Jim and Jimmy Barclay were cooking jambalaya or gumbo. They were there in the morning, they were there in the noon, they were there at night. Now they love doing that, but what would happen if some of us came alongside and said, hey, let me cut some onions for you? I can do that. Not much worse than whacking trees, you know, just smaller scale. <laughs> or sorting clothing. Or a tractor trailer rolls up from Sager Brown, and we're getting supplies that are coming in from Methodist churches all over the world, all, all over the country. I was really blessed by the story of our children's home. My daughter works out there as assistant chaplain, and, and uh, she solicited a, a business. I think she went to Lowe's and got 25 flood buckets. And the kids at the children's home are decorating those with these paint pens and writing things and putting hearts on them. And it's a big thing to them. It's, they, they want to be a part. A lot of those kids are from down there. And then we're going to take those flood buckets, and Rebecca and, and the staff are going to take those flood buckets and they're going to put them in businesses around Ruston. And then they'll be filled with the supplies. And then those kids will seal those buckets up and send them out. You know what that does for those kids in the children's home? It makes them something that matters. They're doing something that matters. So we might get those flood buckets rolling up on a truck, and you're there. You spent the night there, and you got up, and you've had your breakfast, and you're ready to roll, and that truck rolls up. I know what you're going to do. You're going to jump up, and you're going to say, how can we help? And you might spend the day or half a day. We were in Bologna, Arkansas, facing an F2 tornado that went through there, and we were waiting for a work assignment and kind of had a little bit of downtime. We were standing out in front of Bologna United Methodist Church. It had gotten plowed. And uh, we've been cutting trees all day. And uh, it was hot and hard work. Uh, grocery store came up with a bunch of ice chests full of lunch meat and bread and cheese and some condiments. And they were looking around. They said, we've got fixings for sandwiches and the Bologna church secretary was there with all kinds of tasks. People asking her everything. She said, well, we don't have any place to put it. We don't have refrigeration, but we have people that, you know, when we get a crew, we'll make some sandwiches. And the guys and I looked at each other and said, hey, we went and washed our hands three, four times, and, you know, put some of that sanitizer on, a whole bottle of sanitizer on each hand, and went over there and laid some paper down. And, man, we had a production line going. I don't know what they ate for lunch. But those guys got something out in the field, and the homeowners got those sandwiches. So we stay flexible, stay flexible, stay flexible. Supply, handling, distribution, and number six, you see it there on your sheet, whatever it takes, whatever it takes. We do whatever it takes. Our number one rule, remain flexible at all times. Disaster recovery situations change constantly. So where are we? We do it for others, and what's our motto? It's not to complete a task, it's to be a presence. We are the presence of the body of Christ. We do it for others. We have certain tasks, largely to make homes safe, sanitary, and secure. And then there's some do no harm. There's some do no harm guidelines, if you will, and you'll see some of those. Early response teams are completely self-contained. We don't want to go into a community and show up as some of the spontaneously uninvited volunteers do who don't have any plans for a place to spend the night. 
because people show up like that. Sometimes entire crews show up. We were in Joplin, Missouri after the F-5 that went through there, and, and we took a self-contained crew. We were capable of camping out if we had to. As it turned out, it was a Methodist church right down on the Arkansas-Missouri line. We were able to stay there. It took about a 45-minute drive to get into town, but that was fine. We had a roof over our heads, slept on the floor. They had two showers for about 60 volunteers. It was an interesting week. We got to know each other real well. Four or five people can fit in one of those shower stalls at a time <laughs> if you're really desperate. And a cold shower outside with a hose feels pretty good after a long day. Uh, but seriously. Um, so while we were working, truckloads or literally pickup truckloads of college students and teenagers would drive up and down the streets with chainsaws and rakes and shovels and gloves. They had no work orders. They had no place to spend the night. They had no food. They were using the fuel that was so desperately needed by the teams that were there and the few residents that still had vehicles left. They had no ice. So they were adding a burden to the community and to the infrastructure. We don't do that. Do no harm. We go, and when I rolled last week, I had five five-gallon cans of pure gas and two two-and-a-half gallons of two-cycle fuel. I didn't know if I was going to be doing any tree work. I put those in the back of my truck. I didn't have to use them. But if I had been in a place, and, and when I, because I was driving over to Hammond to spend the night, I would refuel in Hammond. Because I don't want to take the fuel out of Denham Springs and have them run dry when they need it and somebody drives up in the pump, they put a bag over the pump. Are you with me? So I, I went to a grocery store down there because my daughter and the people that were mucking out the house where she lived, they were hungry and I went to a grocery store and there was no bread on the shelves. There was no milk in the coolers. I don't want to go down there and take their groceries. So I go plan it now. The things are coming back together uh, right now, but that's a do no harm. We take try to take pictures or recommend the homeowners take pictures before moving anything that's probably already done, uh, or if it's not done, it's not going to be done. But if if you enter to come to a home that's been untouched, suggest to the homeowner and get their permission that they take photographs of every room, of every angle, if possible. Because when it comes time to an insurance claim, and if they don't apply for insurance or don't. Uh, that's another thing, but they've got that information. If they apply to FEMA, FEMA may say, well, we don't have evidence of what you had in this room. We even go so far as to say, if you have appliances, take photographs of the serial number and model number off the back, because if they apply for something to be replaced and say, we lost a washer and dryer, and FEMA says, well, we, we'll give you a bare bones washer and dryer. We'll give you $100 on each one. Oh, no, we had the Whirlpool, you know, Cadillac or whatever. Are you with me? Mm -hmm. So we do everything we can to help them recover as much as they can. We don't take anything off the property unless we've cleared it with them. We get their permission for anything. What appears to be trash to us is someone else's treasure. Evelyn went with a group after one of the hurricanes in the Florida Panhandle, and they were literally, their task, I think they spent three days in the yard just so, sorting and sifting things so that there would be some memorabilia that a woman was looking for. That was that disaster response team's task for, for some of their work. Those things that to us are refuse are valuables to them. So we don't just pick something up and we never, ever say, huh, that's a piece of junk or look at this trash or who would own that or fold up that underwear and say, huh, who would ever wear something like this? If you do that and it gets back to me, I will track you down like a dog. <laughs> is this recording? <laughs> also live stream. What's your name? Kyle. Tyler. Kyle. 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 Thank you, Kyle. Everybody say thank you, Kyle. Thank you, Kyle. All right. Here we go. Do no harm. Always get permission before you move anything. Here's some best practices. And again, this is a rock and roll short course cramming it in. This is a, in the ERT, there would be an off-site. We'd go outside, we'd cut sheetrock, we'd practice. Some best practices. Sheetrock should be cut in a straight line, one foot, approximately one foot above the water line. Now we take some consideration in for the width of a sheet of sheetrock is what? Four, 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 four feet. So if they had two and a half feet of water in the, and you consult with them, it's their disaster, it's not ours. So you might suggest to them, Four feet is a good distance. 
Now a four foot sheet of sheetrock is not going to fit in a four foot space. So we give a four foot and a half inch and it can be bumped up a little bit. Mud, sheetrock mud will cover that just like the blood of Christ covers sin. Sheetrock mud covers a lot of our sin <laughs> on building projects, right Derek? You know, you gotta keep it. So if we, we were doing a house down there uh, this past week and they had six inches of water. So I talked to the homeowner and, and they were wanting to cut it at two feet. It's their project, it's their home, that's their call. Two feet's real hard to, to cut. In my estimation, might as well go up to four. You're not saving a whole lot. But we talked about that, they decided to cut it at four feet. But don't go in the room with a pry bar and a hammer. I took a youth group in Texas one time and the first thing they did, and it was good therapy for them, but they had a big mess to clean up. <laughs> we were gonna renovate this room at a Bible literacy college over there, a center. And those boys went in there with hammers and crowbars, and they just turned that sheetrock into just a big pile of dust. <laughs> well, it didn't hurt anything there, but it's a big waste of energy and time. It's a whole lot better, and y'all are wise enough to do it, to pop a line, with a chalk line and I put a list of some suggested tools for muck out that you want to take with you. And we have tool trailers down there that you can use so you don't have to haul a lot of stuff down there. They're already ready for you to use. We try to use them for out, for out of state teams that are coming great distances. If you're needing to use one, I'll set you up. We have several down there. That's my job. So we pop a line, we cut it. You can cut it with a utility knife. I can cut rock really fast if I have a generator with a extension cord and a 110 volt circular saw. They have these little saws with a blade about that big. And I can cut the rock in this room in probably 10 minutes. You can do that with a utility knife and it's gonna take you a long time and you'll be worn out. So that's just the thought. We cut it on a straight line. We don't wanna go zigzag or, you know, we take out some here and down here and here because what does that do? We just made more work for the person who comes in behind us, whether it's them or the contractor. A lot of them are going to do it themselves. So we knock this wall out up here, and we got this big, it looks like a roller coaster, and then this one over here is over here. We created work. We didn't help them. So let's do it right. So we pop a line, we cut it off, we pull it out as best as possible in large segments, and that sheetrock is falling off the wall right now. It's pretty mushy. So that means it needs to be cut a little bit higher. If it's soft like that, we're not cutting it high enough. The insulation behind there needs to come out. I like taking these big floor shock fans, circular the box fans don't move that much air. We have several fans on our trailers, uh, like your janitor probably uses on a floor. Borrow your janitors, they won't miss it. Just, you know, those commercial fans, you know what I'm talking about. It's a squirrel cage fan, I don't know, there's probably a fancy name for it. So once we take the rock out and the sheet rock out, we turn the fans on and it'll dry that place out. Now there's, what do you use for mold when you have a mold, have, well, what do you spray before anything? Anyone want to guess? Bleach. Bleach. Shockwave. Not bleach. Bleach. We use shockwave or, and I always have problems with this name. Chromium. Shock, yeah. Conchromium. Is that how it's pronounced? See? Say it with authority, whether it's chromium. Chromium. <laughs> Probably a biblical <laughs> word, like one of those. It's <laughs> yeah. an Old Testament name. Don't name your child. It's called chromium. You know? Okay. So, uh, shockwave or conchromium. You can get conchromium from Lowe's or Home Depot shockwave. You just have to either order online or and you can probably get it from Amazon and get it delivered before you leave or you can get it from some janitorial supplies. It's highly concentrated, it takes two to four ounces per gallon. It doesn't kill any more mold if you use a half a gallon in a gallon. It needs to go a long way because you're gonna to wanna to spray the house thoroughly all the exposed studs. Jared? The sprayers, do we need to take those? Or? A pump sprayer is good. I think I have that on the list. I'm not sure it uh, should be on the list. Uh, yeah, no. Pump sprayers, I'll try to create a muck out uh, okay. tool list for you. Pump sprayers are good, and, and I, I buy some cheap ones because I've oftentimes left them high, behind for the homeowner. Uh, they're gonna have another room to do, or they're gonna wanna do the outside with some bleach. Bleach is good for mildew, but it, there are some mold spores it doesn't touch. In an emergency, I've made a cocktail of some chemicals that will kill 
mold, but I won't go into that. I'd have to tell you if I told the form. Uh, and I understand really strong vinegar works. I've bought some 30% acetic acid, which is vinegar, and there's a certain percentage of that. But just shockwave and chromium is the thing to use. Okay. I want to say a word about self-care, and then I'm going to take some questions and, and hopefully have some answers for you. Self-care. We have a rule uh, that we try to follow. Uh, we're not always real good at it. Um, because we get real tax oriented. It's called free and out. Work three days, pull back. Now, in your case, you're, you may just be going down for three days, but you will have emotional and physical and mental fatigue if you stay on it constantly for much longer than that. And uh, especially in areas that are heavily devastated. And there's some areas down there that if you drive in there and when you get out, of, you don't even get out of the vehicle and your heart is crushed. Uh, I took some really tough guys, heavy equipment operators and chainsaw operators. They were mostly Denham Springs guys. Our largest cadre of trained ERTs was from Denham Springs Methodist Church. All but one of them was flooded out, so we lost a huge number of our trained ERT responders who would be on the ground right now, but they've lost their belongings. So the three and out is take three days, take a break for your recharging, renewal. I like to have a nightly debriefing, and you may do this on your mission trips, but a simple way that I learned from a, a former youth uh, minister at Denham Springs, actually, Sarah Shoup, was every week she just talked to the kids about roses and thorns. And so, so it might sound a little corny, it might sound a little kind of, but it works. And every night we would just say, hey, what were some of the high moments of, of the day? Well, I really liked eating this time. You know, that was really cool. Well, it was really neat to eat supper at that really strange roadside cafe. Well, what were some? Yeah, we did that. Cut and shoot alley. Um, what were some of the uh, downers of the day? And then we just give each other time to share that. Well, it was a bummer that we drove up to that house and there was no work to do. And it was locked, and the client wasn't there, and there was a crazy dog in the backyard. So we had to turn around and drive 20 mile miles to find where we were. And that happens. Ever done that, Jerry? <laughs> it happens. Stay flexible. It's not about us. So that nightly debriefing, what were some of the high moments, the blessings, and the downers, the clouds? Um, that's pretty much what I had for you. On the back side, you're going to see a suggested mini muck out tool checklist. Uh, I do have a set of forms and from our official ERT manual that you'll want to have, whoever your team leader is, I'll get them to you, Leslie, uh, a personal release, a waiver that you will submit that says, I'm going as a volunteer and I hold them up, Louisiana Conference and the church and, and harmless. There's a medical information form. If something would happen to you, we need to know if you have certain medication, uh, physical needs, uh, diabetic, etc. cetera. Um, we've never had that on teams that I've been on, but it can happen. Uh, I believe there's one other form, and it, I think it's a medical release. It's medical information, medical release for treatment, and uh, the uh, release of waiver liability. Um, you'll see there, I also copied what I got from somewhere, I don't even remember where it came from, maybe Missouri Conference, what we call a covenant for success, and I'll just go through it very quickly. We are privileged to have the opportunity to serve our great God by being volunteers in mission. Our primary purpose as volunteers is to radiate the love of Jesus Christ. We are to invest ourselves in the mission and honor God in all we do. So we need to remain flexible, adaptable, sensitive, and patient. There will be times when we may want to hurry and get things done, but delays happen. We will make the best of the quiet time to rest, to get acquainted with the clients and with one another and people who are serving alongside, and enjoy our shared community. Cooperation is the key. We will need to cooperate with many persons and conditions. Just put on a smile. A happy, positive attitude goes a long way, especially on hot, muggy days, and so here's some guidelines. One, remain flexible at all times. Number two, refer to the leader for any changes, suggestions, or concerns. We can't all be chiefs. There's gonna to have to be one 
one chief and the rest of us are Indians, and we, if a question comes from a, someone will walk up and say, can you muck out my house next? Don't commit to things that you can't fulfill. And so we say, ask Leslie, and Leslie will deal with that. That's the team leader's job. Uh, work to acceptable standards. I love the scripture where it says, whatever you do, do it as unto the Lord. If that was where Jesus lived, how would you be doing? How would you be behaving? How would you be conducting yourself? Do your best, if not better. It's an offering. Your service is an offering to the Lord. Ask questions if you don't know how or what to do next. The only dumb questions are those that don't get asked. We're no, none of us are experts in anything or, or in everything. Don't assume you know the entire plan, so ask before you start a new project. It may be that they're going to demolish the garage. There was a lake front property where we were doing a community in Oklahoma a uh, year ago in the summer and somebody started over in the garage and started taking things down off the wall and uh, putting things up and homeowner said hey don't have to do that I'm demolishing that building it's going to be torn completely down we represent the body of Christ at all times we are witnessed by our words our actions and our attitudes we try to keep our workspace and our living space neat and clean. Um, you're going to be possibly sleeping in conditions you know, on a floor. And I recommend air mattresses or cots. They do have, sometimes provide those things, but I go ready to not have anything. We have a few. Okay, yeah. And, and I have cots too you can take. Anyway, keep your workspace neat and clean. Uh, don't criticize, gossip, or start rumors. And number 10 of the Ten Commandments is express appreciation to the host of the team that's the church that puts you up uh, and they'll bless you anyway and you're going to be blessed questions i'll do my best yes sir on the sheet rock when we talk about cutting it up most of the time around four feet mm -hmm. uh, if they have the bad insulation behind it can you cut that off even with the sheet rock if it's cut one foot above if the water, say, came in at two feet right. and you cut it at four, the insulation probably is okay if you take it off at four feet, certainly. But we just say one foot above the flood line. Now, if you, if it, sometimes it will only seep up to, and rock that's been laid horizontally, it may not seep up past that seam. And you may be able to cut it. We actually, we were doing a house where we cut it right at the seam. And we, as we cut it, it popped out right at the seam where it had been put in before which is gonna make it really easy to put it back in. We checked the insulation behind it and it had not gotten up that high. It had wicked up into the sheetrock, but it had been in and out of that house pretty quick, so it didn't have a chance to soak. Does that help? If, it, if you cut and you feel up in there and you're feeling wet, you need to pull it out a little bit. And it can be pushed back up in there. So good question. But don't pull it out, we don't need to pull it out. Don't pull it out unless it needs to be cut it off there. And you can do that with a good utility knife. Um, you'll see the work uh, list, some of the check uh, list, uh, dust masks, and I know it's a pain to wear goggles, but my daughter was helping muck out the house that she had been living in, uh, and uh, she, I saw her doing this and shaking her head, and she turned around, and she was squinting so hard she couldn't open her eyes, and some dust had gotten in one of her eyes. So I took her outside, took some bottled water, and just kicked her head back and just fluttered her with the bottle of water. My daughter got metal in her eye from a, uh, a tool. Yeah. And it just flecked out the, the saw yeah. and probably put it into her eye. Those of us who wear glasses can get away with some of that sometimes, but dust can get in behind the glasses very easily. When I was younger, I didn't wear a lot of safety gear. You know, I, when I go and do chainsaw work, I have a hard hat with earmuffs and a built-in shield, and I wear everything I can, uh, steel toed boots and, and chaps. Other questions? Safety gear, heavy take care of yourselves. Too. Heavy, those heavy, heavy gloves. gloves, you'll go through gloves pretty quickly, especially if they start to get wet. Um, I, I'd go to Harbor Freight or someplace like that and buy a 12 pack. It, you'll, you'll have extras, and if you have extras when you get ready to leave, you know where you can leave them? leave them right there because they'll be put to use by other crews that come in and by the homeowners. Good point. 
how do we schedule a team? Scheduling and teams. And how large, how small, we don't want to be a burden. Well, and that's part of my job as a conference coordinator. Deborah's a member of the Grace <laughs> Church, and they're not going to have a pastor here for a few days, <laughs> which is what happened already last week. But uh, your new pastor will probably be better at <laughs> the things that I don't do anyway. So when appointments come, I'll be somewhere else. That's okay. There's a question on the floor. The question on the floor <laughs> is scheduling individuals and teams. We hope to have by 10 o'clock Monday morning tomorrow an online on our conference website, la-umc.org, a point where you can register and it will automatically populate a spreadsheet that, that I use in sending the teams to the proper place. We want to make sure you have housing and the best support you can have and be as close as you can to where you'll be working. Traffic is horrendous down there. We don't want to take excess vehicles either because right now the roads are so clogged up um, that, and we were in Texas doing this uh, at Christmas time when the storm hit Garland. Uh, the police just had to shut down the whole neighborhood because there were so many volunteers in there. If there had been an emergency, a fire, an ambulance needed, no one could have gotten in there. Question? Say, Does that answer your question? So you'll be able to go online, there will be a little sign up. Uh, we like to take teams. It's really hard. It's as much work for me to register to assign one person. Now tomorrow there's three uh, young men coming from Chatham are going down to link up with the team in Clinton. I know that team, I know who they are, I know where they are, I know the housing capabilities. And so I know the host churches and I know the places that they're going. They have their client base already established. They've done their own assessment work. They've been out in the field, they have their tools. They're just worn out. And they're mostly retirees and they're just worn slap out. So these are some young guys. They're gonna go down there with fresh backs. And they said, what do we need to take? I said, muscles. <laughs> Does that answer your question? You can register online, and that's how we're fun funneling the uh, teams in there right now. Can we coordinate, too, like multiple churches? Absolutely. Can churches can combine. We have cluster churches that come together. Uh, in Tennessee, there's a group around Nashville, around Murfreesboro, that do this naturally, and it strengthens their bond mm -hmm. across congregational and sometimes across denominational lines to work together for the common good, and that's what we're about. We'd love to work. Oh, we'd love to link up with y'all. That'd be awesome, because we're coming and going. And if anybody's going over to Rayville area or Mer Rouge in the next couple of days, the little church in Mer Rouge, Louisiana, 26 members, sent four boxes of personal hygiene goods, little personal soaps and shampoos for the shower trailer that we hauled down last week. 400 of each that they put together 26 wow. members boxes of new towels and washcloths that we stocked on the shelves of our shower trailer because those people that have evacuated we put it at st john's united methodist church in off island road those people that evacuated got out with the clothes on their back how are they going to use a shower trailer if they don't have a towel and a washcloth soap shampoo toothbrushes, toothpaste, and they got all these personal items, enough for 400 people. <laughs> and the pastor, Pastor Joy and Karen says, well, maybe this will inspire some other small churches to do the same. I said, I hope it inspires some big churches. <laughs> and I know y'all are doing it and sending, and y'all are great. I've seen your, your work. I know your words. Yes, sir. I didn't see chainsaw here. I have one. Is that something? Uh, that I took five chainsaws down this week, and they all came back with me. There's, I didn't see a single tree. I took them because sometimes in a flood there will be a tree that will drop, and invariably, if I hadn't taken them, there would be the trees, and they'd say, "Hey, does anybody have a chainsaw?" It's not bad to have one. I don't leave home without it. You know. I'm going to make one of those memes, you know, like the guy that drinks beer and he says, you know coolest guy in the world was this, you know, you know what I'm talking about, the beer, dos equos, and he says, you know, I don't do this, but when I do, I do this. I'm going to make one that, you know, with a tool, and I'm going to something <laughs> like a chainsaw, and it's going to say, I don't usually drag a trailer around, but <laughs> when I do, days. it's full of tools. <laughs> <laughs> who, who else? What else? Anything? 
that uh, 60 people in two showers? Do you get to apply for your team? Or <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, and that I, one of the things that we've been asked, the Clinton Church is fielding teams right now. And, uh, and we have one shower trailer in the conference. So First Methodist in Baton Rouge has asked if I can either find one for them used or I would build one. I'm not personally going to build a trailer. Although we have like a trailer museum at Grace right now with all these things. And most of them, half of them are down in the zone right now. But um, I suggested maybe we should send an ERT crew when we slack up just a little bit who could build some outside showers. Yeah. You could be deck ministry, build a deck, put some corrugated tin sides up and a shower head and build them a set of showers. I saw where somebody took portalettes and made showers out of them. They put a shower head in the top and they put, the, now that's kind of a small space and it might need to have a collateral. There are tents actually that you can buy on Amazon that are, that are tent showers. They're, uh, they're about four by six and, you know. I just got one question. Certainly. Um, and we don't have to be live streaming all of this. You can cut this off at any time. I don't mind. Go ahead. When we come as a team member and our tools are, are taken care of, do we bring water? Do we bring we food wanna, to help the church? Yeah, it, as much as we can, we want to not be a burden to mm -hmm. the system. Um, right now, there are mountains of bottled okay. water in most of those places. Uh, as I said, we went to Valonia or maybe it was Coleman, Alabama a few years ago, and a tractor trailer came and offloaded drinking water. And it sat there in the sun for three days and cooked. And only the water that was up in, you know, the first three or four feet in uh, was undrinkable. They say it releases something, but you could taste, it just tasted like plastic, you know, carcinogens or something. So we dug through mm -hmm. and basically threw away half that water until we got to the inside, they had no place to store it. There was no shade in the middle of the summer. So we try to go self-contained. I do have a list in the manual of uh, suggested personal items mm -hmm. to take, clothing. Um, I like to take several pairs of shoes or boots because uh, invariably, and I was walking through yards last week, and, um, and you get in a soft yard pushing a wheelbarrow, um, and, and you get your, your boots or shoes wet, and you want to have a pair to put on and a pair to be dry. Uh, and there's power in the churches. The ch we will not send you to a host church that doesn't have some power. We're, we're not at a place where you're going to have to carry your tent and everything, but you want to take linens. I, I suggest carrying a, an air mattress or a cot. Um, because some of them will have cots and air mattresses, but some of them won't. Uh, and I slept on the floor of a church this week that didn't have anything. Uh, I had a sleeping bag, and I just laid on the sleeping bag on the floor, and which you is so fine. tired, you probably didn't care. I do AT, camping and backpacking and snores and mm -hmm. sleeping in a shelter. And Jerry, yeah, and, and you get tired enough, you sleep real good. Mosquito repellent, bug repellent. Did I put that on there? I may I not have. Uh, take some mosquito repellent. Um, I, I wasn't bothered by them on this trip, but I, I saw people that were. And um, a tip I learned several years ago uh, in backpacking was to take high doses of vitamin C. And uh, so I, what's that? B1. B1. Mm -hmm. And I think what it does is it just changes the body chemistry. And, and I got mine changed just enough so that if I get enough of that, whatever repels mosquitoes are just distasteful to the them, they go over and bite you. <laughs> and that's all your goal is. You know, it's like killing ants. You spray it for fire ants or roaches, you're just trying to drive them to the neighbors. You're not trying to grab them. You just want to, you know, get them off of your property. That's what you're doing. Right? Okay. What else? No silly questions, but Jerry, you, good point. Mosquito repellent, and, and I, don't, I, I don't think I put on here, oh, rain ponchos, that's something we put in the gear list for the crew. Ponchos don't keep a whole lot of rain off you, and you get wet and they stick to you, but um, are you prepared to work in the rain? 
you going to stop because it rains in South Louisiana. It was raining today down there. Can y'all be in prayer because there's a storm out there that's percolating? Heading west, north, west, and that's not a good thing. It's off the coast of Africa right now. Questions? Um, you know, if you're good with that utility knife that cuts wall <laughs> you can take a snake out. I that close. <laughs> I like to practice with my utility knife. Put a rubber snake on the floor about 10 feet away and practice throwing until you can hit him right between the eyes. That's a good question. Our children's director, Grace, got struck by a water moccasin up in Arkansas uh, two weeks ago on Wednesday. She was in church uh, this week. Foot is still swollen. And it's very painful. Uh, didn't have to take antivenin. Uh, if you're wearing muck boots, um, you're probably somewhat protected. I haven't seen any, and snakes don't like people. They'll they'll be leaving. But um, snakes do find their way, especially rattlesnakes like piles of junk and debris and wood piles. Copperheads love wood piles, and there are water moccasins wherever there's water. So snakes are a possibility. I did say sign that medical release <laughs> and the waiver of liability, right? And it releases, uh, you know, you're on your own. No, um, but that's a good question. There's snakes out there. Other questions? So we can't kill them. Not, we don't have to be. We don't have to shoot them out. We can't kill them. It's, like, it's part of the mucking out process. If they're in the building and they don't belong there. Our job is to make it safe, oh, safe. sanitary, <laughs> and secure. <laughs> safe, sanitary, and secure. And if there's a snake in my house, <laughs> I'm going to make it safe. Connie? I noticed there was a lot of communication this week between uh, Michigan Church and people wanting to come by and get pick up flood buckets mm -hmm. that were supposed to have been coming from Texas, and they did not get them till yesterday. Mm -hmm. And there were people trying to come all week. Is that a real issue right now, like they don't have enough flood buckets? Well, what happened, the question about flood buckets, uh, we almost cannot have enough flood buckets because if we end up with excess, we'll send them back to Sacred Brown, Uncor Depot. And with the spring floods, Arkansas, Louisiana, Texas, Mississippi, and Oklahoma had a level of flooding this spring many places like ours. They're doing heavy case management in southern Arkansas just because there's a state line there and then you know, flood stop there in Mississippi. So we depleted almost entirely the stores of flood buckets at, at uh, Sega Round. So if we end up with excess flood buckets, and there are a lot coming in right now, but we're also dealing with logistical uh, issues right now. The phone systems have been down in Baton Rouge. They're coming back. If you have an AT&T phone and you go down there, and you find that people are not calling you and related to the movement of flood buckets, we're having trouble just calling each other across town and saying, we've got a load of flood buckets here and we don't need as many as we're getting. Or a call goes, if you have an AT, so we're trying, some of it's a distribution issue, but we can't take, take too many down there in my estimation. They will, if there are any left over, we'll send them to Sega Brown, we'll repack them. They'll be ready for the next time. So it may be a good idea for every group that goes down to take the fill buckets with them. That's an awesome idea. Take flood buckets with you. Fill your vehicles with things that can be used that are practical. Um, this morning I suggested to Grace that um, clothing is not an issue unless you want to send uh, clean underwear that's unopened packages. Uh, not used underwear. <laughs> It's like, it's like a used toothbrush. Yeah, I got a drawer full of used toothbrushes. I'm using them for cleaning, you know, paint saws. You know, there's three things that you never loan, right? Underwear. Is it still running? Thank <laughs> you.
it's a priority list. <laughs> and if you own a truck or a tractor, you can add that on there. Three T's, the tools, the four T's, the tools, the toothbrush, the truck, and the tractor never go off the property. <laughs> All right out there? Okay. Good questions. Hope this has been helpful to you. We're going to do ERT, T, ERT certified training in Baton Rouge, hopefully, and it will be up on the conference web when we get it arranged. We're trying to do it each of the next two Saturdays graciously. Uh, Byron Mann of Arkansas Conference is driving down from Harrison, Arkansas to be in Baton Rouge. It's a big haul for him. But we need some ERT certified trainers. I'd love for us to host one right here at Trinity and train every one of y'all so that we're ready to roll at a moment's notice when they're calling for us to be able to go and serve other conferences as they've served us. That'd be cool. Great. ERT work, early response team work, is like a mission trip with no plan. <laughs> now we're going to Ecuador the week of Thanksgiving with the group from Grace. We're going to be planning. We're planning right now for that. We know the dates, all that sort of stuff. We didn't plan for this. It started raining, and it didn't stop. It's a mission trip without a plan, without a forward plan. But there is. There may not be the plan, but there's preparation. And so for us to be as prepared as we can with training, with tools, with collegial fellowship, working together, and we can do some things locally that just is team building, community building, relationship building, so when we go on the road and we're working alongside each other, we know each other and we can work together more effectively for the good of the whole and for the kingdom. You all okay with that? Yes, Holly. What is the minimum age to get I think what we're doing right now is 17 is the minimum age. There is a youth waiver that we have that has to be signed by a parent and I believe uh, if we do it properly, it requires a, a notary. Um, if they're under 17? If, if they are 17. I don't think we take anyone under 17, but I can double check on that. Um, when we get it up on the website, it will have, I think it, it says uh, youth, so that would be 17 and 18, I think, or maybe just a 17. Um, if they didn't do field work, could they do any volunteer? Yeah, there's volunteer work to be done on site and relief to help the, the workers that are there. It might be in the, in the relief center, it might be in the kitchen, uh, and, and those sorts of things. So that's a good idea. And as the rebuild comes, this is going to be a long term rebuild. Here's the rule of 10 that we follow in, in a disaster it's a tenfold increase from stage to stage to stage. If the event, and this is a rough, thing because it doesn't apply everything, but if the event lasted four days and they had, say, four days of rain and flooding where the water was up before it cleared out, there's going to be roughly 40 days of early response work. And again, we're not early responders, we're our early response team, we're not, first res we're not first responders, we go in on invitation after they've given the all clear and with the knowledge of the people that are there. Four days of an event, four days of flooding, is going to be 40 days of early response work, and I'm just pulling those numbers out, and 400 days of rebuild. It's a tenfold number. If, and now that doesn't, that's not a hard and fast rule because the tornado that went through Joplin, the F5, in 2012, four years ago, we got home from Coleman, Alabama on Saturday, Sunday night, an F5 came through three quarters of a mile wide, six miles long. The first work assignment they gave to us, I drove by to check it out, that's my job. When I go on a team, is to go and make sure there's work to be done. The people had evacuated that night, because when a tornado comes, the rain doesn't stop. It rained the rest of the night. So they evacuated, went to a, a junior college out of town, or on the edge of town. They, they put in an application to have their house cleaned up debris removal. The National Guard was there. There were no street signs. They had spray painted the names of the streets on the roads. 
We were driving around zigzagging telephone poles and we ended up working on a house right across from where they were working with cadaver dogs and search and rescue. They had cleared this block and they had wanted us to demolish this house. We were at that time working for the city of Joplin and they had search and rescue with cadaver dogs working right across the street. And you see that kind of stuff going on, that's why you take three and out. Because some of those tough guys that run big chainsaws that I don't even want to pick up, and they run heavy equipment, when we drove into that town, everything got quiet. We got back to the, because we drove in to check things out. We got back to the church that night and we all just kind of sat there. Because it looked like a nuclear bomb had gone off. So I drove down a road trying to find that address of that house. And when I turned the road, the National Guardman just shook his head. We had those crossing flame magnetic signs. He knew where we were. They've seen us before. And he just shook his head. And I turned to go up that road and I got to the middle of the block. They had a house number painted on the curb. That's the only way I knew there was been a house there at one time. There wasn't anything sitting on that property bigger than a shoebox. Everything had been sucked off the earth or chewed up and spit out like paper mache. Well, I don't know if you know this, some folks from Trinity may know. Trinity has an ERT trailer full of tools and ready all the time. We just haven't had a team in a while. Kind of rock and roll. It would be yep. great if we could train the team. We're about it almost, but on that note, uh, is it okay if I share some dates and see just sure. some people that are here so they know 